<clears throat> Good morning and welcome to our service this morning on this third Sunday of Easter. I'm Sean, I'm still one of the church wardens and still taking these services until we hopefully get our new vicar, which is looking more and more likely at the moment. We're still praying for the right person. So let's just draw into worship now with these words. Answer us when we call, O oh God. Be gracious and hear our prayer. Let the light of your face shine on us, for you put gladness in our hearts. Amen. So, mm, where is safe? I think most of us have places where we can go or things we like to do when life becomes a little bit threatening or we need to feel safe. Sometimes it might be an actual place. Sometimes it could be a place that's in our minds. We might feel that home is safe, but not if we're going to be a victim of domestic violence and not if we take note of all the accident statistics. Church ought to be safe. And I think the church has worked hard to protect children and vulnerable adults from abuse. Sometimes we have been told to leave the rest of our life at the door so that we are not distracted by our own difficulties in a dangerous world when we come into church. And sometimes that's actually quite difficult to do. So I'm going to use two readings today. The first one is taken from Acts. And chapter 3 and verses 12 to 19. If you want to pause the video and follow this in your own Bible, please do so. So this reading is from Acts chapter 3. And I'm reading between verses 12 and verses 19. At the start of this chapter, Peter healed a crippled beggar who's been asking them for money. As you might imagine he would. And then this beggar is full of joy and he's going around now telling everybody about what's happened to him and how he can walk and he's no longer crippled. And all those people, like we would probably do, have all gone running to over where Peter is. And that's where this reading begins. So when Peter saw this, that's all these people coming running towards him because he from this miracle, he said to them, men of Israel, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the holy and righteous one and ask that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead, and we are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has given this complete healing to him, as you can all see. Now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. This is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Christ would suffer. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. And this is the word of our Lord. So I suppose on the moral front, Peter's speech to the temple crowd following that healing of the crippled beggar commences with the identification of the Israelites as responsible for the rejection and killing of Jesus. This could be and has been used as a justification for anti-Semitism, starting with the Jews being held responsible for the death of Jesus and then extending to the hatred and blaming of Jews for a whole range of society's ills. A few years ago, the editor of a well-known daily newspaper once said that the mark of a good news report was that readers would be left knowing who to blame. And Peter, despite the euphoria of the crowd following the healing of the crippled beggar, 
makes a speech that leads to his arrest as he becomes a threat to the religious authorities. Soon Stephen is to become the first Christian martyr stoned to death by those same authorities. But Peter does not simply attribute blame for the rejection of Jesus on the crowd and their rulers. He goes on to identify Jesus as the resurrected author of life. He calls the crowd his friends, explains their actions were due to ignorance, and on account of them, God's purposes are fulfilled, evil wiped out, and times of refreshment are at hand. In all this, it's not Peter showing the Christian way through both the healing of the cripple, the message of reconciliation and hope for the future. Peter provides both comfort and challenge to his listeners. So now I'm going to move us on to our gospel reading. And this week it's taken from Luke and chapter 24, starting at verse 36. And we'll hear in this, the disciples being told that they were witnesses of Jesus' resurrection. And this encourages us to think how we are being witnesses today. So let's take our reading from Luke 24, starting at verse 36. While they were still talking about this, Jesus stood among them and he said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, why are you troubled? Why do doubts rise in your minds? Put my hands and my feet. It is I myself, touch me and see. Ghost does not have flesh and bones that you can see I have. When he said this, he showed them his hands and feet. While they still did not believe it because of the joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish. And he took it and ate it in their presence. And he said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms. And then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my father has promised. Stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. And this is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. I think, understandably, those first disciples are gathered together immediately after the resurrection for mutual comfort and safety. I would think they're feeling very unsafe, wondering if there's going to be a knock at the door to any. And as we've just seen, their experience of the risen Christ is described in words like startled and terrified and frightened. Jesus did not appear in order to reassure them that it was all fine that they could be safe in their small groups forevermore. He appeared before them to give them the challenge to spread the word, thank goodness. So now I'd like to read the homily that I have ready for today. Since Jesus' resurrection on Easter Sunday, We've been reading Luke's gospel. It's been sharing stories of peoples and their encounters with the risen Jesus, with Mary Magdalene and the other woman. who met two men dressed in dazzling white clothing at the empty tomb. But their story had been dismissed by the disciples. And Peter visited the empty tomb. And finally, is the story of Cleopas and his companion meeting Jesus as they walked along the road toward the town of Emmaus. And later, when Jesus broke bread with them, they recognised him and they ran all the way back to Jerusalem to share the news of the risen Jesus with the disciples. So, having a look now at our gospel reading that we've just heard, finds the disciples talking about what they've heard from various eyewitnesses 
And suddenly, Jesus is there right in the middle of them, which really made them jump. Made me jump as well, I think. Despite all the time Jesus had spent teaching and preparing them before his crucifixion, they still did not really understand what the future was going to look like. So it's not surprising that they didn't expect what happened that day. Suddenly, they had Jesus there with them and saying, peace be with you. The last thing that was with them at that moment was peace. And the disciples are really freaked out thinking they're seeing a ghost. The idea of Jesus being a ghost actually is an interesting one. According to Wikipedia, ghosts are often thought to be deceased people looking for vengeance or imprisoned on earth for bad things they did during life. Jesus, on the other hand, taught that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his, the Messiah's name, to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. And as the disciples floundered in their confusion and uncertainty, Jesus simply uttered the words, See, it is I, myself. And Jesus even ate that piece of fish to prove he wasn't a ghost. I mean, ghosts don't eat. I don't think I've never met one. The disciples would have been aware of the implications of suggesting that Jesus was a ghost and the teachings around them. In his first letter to Timothy, the Apostle Paul wrote, Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will renounce the faith by paying attention to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons, through the hypocrisy of liars whose consciences are seared with a hot iron. They forbid marriage and demand abstinence from foods, which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe in no and despite Jesus telling his disciples everything they would need to know about what was going to happen, three times at least, certainly in Luke's gospel and in the others, still don't understand. Three times Jesus had explained that he would need to be killed and rise again from the dead on the third day in order to fulfil what had been written about the Messiah in the Old Testament, and the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms. In Luke's Gospel, in chapter 18, and verse 34, he followed up by writing that the disciples understood nothing because what Jesus said was hidden from them, so they would not grasp what he was saying. Perhaps that's the case sometimes with us as we move towards an understanding of something with our baby footsteps. But then Jesus opened the minds of the disciples to understand the scriptures as he explained for the final time the purpose of the Messiah, that he should suffer for mankind, be killed and rise again on the third day. The purpose of this was to obtain repentance and forgiveness of sins for all nations beginning from Jerusalem. The role of the disciples was to witness these things happening, which they did, even if it was from a distance at the crucifixion. And then to continue that witness by taking the news out to all the nations. We see examples of them doing this in Luke's second book, the Acts of the Apostles. So the disciples take the message of God's love out to both Jews and Gentiles. This morning's passage is a pivotal one leading to various changes. The responsibility for speaking the word of God passes from Jesus to his disciples and subsequently through the generations unto us. We have the touching scene of the fishers of fish offering Jesus what could be their final catch before they move on to becoming the fishers of men. The disciples have been the witnesses to Jesus on earth. The word witness has two aspects to it. First, we have the aspect of being an eyewitness to events, physically seeing and experiencing Jesus and his life. The second aspect, however, is the act of testimony, telling other people what has been witnessed, what you've seen. The eyewitness accounts of Jesus's life on earth, what to give testimony to the truth of his life. The disciples' eyewitness accounts can be read about in the New Testament of the Bible, and that is where we receive our understanding of Jesus from. The witnesses of this handful of people has reached out to millions of people over the generations and centuries, 
until they come to us today. We are privileged to be part of that story. We may not have spent three years walking alongside Jesus and seeing him perform miracles and hear his teachings. We may not have that first-hand experience that the original disciples had. We can play our part. What we do have, though, is our own lived experience of seeing Christ in the people around us. Ordinary people like us doing extraordinary things sometimes. We can know his presence with us when we experience the tough times. We can sense God's grief when senseless things happen. We don't walk alone. We can take the opportunity to share the gospel with people around us. We don't necessarily feel confident doing that. We can witness through our actions, living out the command to love our neighbour as ourselves. Finally, we can share our own stories with people. As St Francis of Assisi stated, preach the gospel at all times. When necessary, use words. In other words, our actions are saying a lot. Today's reading has started the ball rolling for what was to become the Christian church. A small group of ordinary people chose to step up and tell the story they had learned from the best teacher they could have known. The story has been passed to us over the centuries, initially by word of mouth and then by the written word. It's now our turn to play our part in that story of life and love. May the Lord bless you. Amen. So let's come to our Father God now in prayer. Father God, we thank you for the love you lavish on us and the privilege we enjoy of being able to be children of God. When we are afraid, you are with us. When we rejoice, you are with us. When we are reflective and challenged, you are with us. We pray today that we will know your presence in our lives, especially in the times when we might think we are alone. Lord, in your mercy. Our we thank you for your church here on earth as we try our best to do your work. We pray wisdom for all church leaders and a desire to remember the ties that bind different denominations together, rather than the tensions that might divide us. We thank you for everyone who serves, whether it's a PCC or an elder or whatever, the church wardens, welcome as servers, flower rangers, cleaners, musicians children's workers and more, anybody in your church who does God's work. They know the love they show as they carry out their roles and we pray for strength and enthusiasm to continue particularly numbers of small people pressure. Lord, in your mercy, receive our prayer. Creator God, we thank you for the beauty of your wonderful environment and ask that we will have the wisdom and desire to care for it rather than simply squandering it. We pray for the peoples whose lives depend on the land and are impacted by the thoughtless actions of more developed parts of the world. We pray that we will remember that we are all each other's neighbours, even if that neighbour is not actually known to us personally. Lord, in your mercy, receive us. Merciful God, as we look at the world around us, we pray for world leaders and all people in positions of authority. We pray that you will give them wisdom, honesty, humility and a compassion in all their actions and decisions. Particularly, as here in the UK, we prepare for a general election at some point this year. We pray for the civil servants, for the local councillors as they work to support their local communities. We pray especially for the parts of the world at war with their neighbours and the thousands and thousands of innocent people whose lives are being shattered. We really ask that your lasting peace will break them. Lord, in your mercy, receive our prayer. Loving Father, we pray for community, 
we thank you for the friendship and fellowship we have with people around us. We pray that when we need a comforting word, people will be there for us. And we pray to be able to see when others are in need so that we can be there for them. We pray for everyone who is finding life a struggle now, worrying where their next meal will come from or whether they can afford to live. We pray for children and young people who might be worried about whether there's a future for them in a world where things might look bleak, and older people who share those concerns. Lord, in your mercy, receive. We pray this morning for everyone who is ill, mind, body, spirit. We ask that they will feel your loving arms around them, support the friends, the family, and professionals who care for them, and give them strength. And they'll eat. We take a moment to remember before you people whose names are on our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear us. We remember the people who are coming to the end of their earthly lives who, or who have recently died. Receive them into your loving arms. We pray for those who will be left behind to grieve, regardless of whether that grief is new and raw, older and sharp. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. And can we join together now to say together the prayer of our Lord. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. So just to finish, really, I think the question is, do we accept both the comfort Jesus gave us when he said, peace be with you, as well as the challenge when he sent his disciples out into the world to preach the news about Jesus? Are we those sort of people or are we actually selective followers of the way? You know, the peace be with you may provide immediate comfort. Even if it's not always material, it can provide ongoing strength to cope with adversity. But a challenge has to be accepted, as Jesus himself did on his path to the cross. The post-Jesus physically alive accounts in Acts furnish many examples the early followers of the way striving to emulate, yes, to be representative of the living Christ in all aspects of their lives. Success in human terms was never guaranteed, and there were disputes and there were disagreements to be worked through. People were human. Our context might be different and varied and generally a bit less dramatic. Still, presenting the challenge of being Christ in our personal relationships and in our mode of living, allocating time and money, identifying need, caring, challenging the unjust, responding to external events, and each need to identify our own. So during the week, may the grace of God uphold you and the peace of God surround you. And the love of God flow from you and the strength of God protect you and bring you safely through the week. I see you following Sunday. May God bless you. Thank you.